Crimes Commission EFCC, Ola Olukayode, and the Secretary Mohammed Hamajoda for confirmation. The request is in conformity with the provisions of the EFCC Act. Also transmitted to the Senate is the request for the approval of the appointment of Halima Shehu as the National Coordinator of the National Social Investment Program Agency, NSIPA. This is to fill the vacancy created following the appointment of the former National Coordinator, Delu Bulus Yakubu, as the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation. The House of Representatives has passed a resolution urging the security agencies to secure the release of 30 female students of Federal University Gusau and eight core members who were kidnapped by armed bandits and are still in captivity in Zamfara State. This follows a motion by Representative Kabiru Amadu, who expressed worry that the prevalent activities of armed bandits in Zamfara and the Northwest Geopolitical Zone have led to tremendous reduction in school enrollment. Today is exactly three weeks and two days that these innocent girls are still in captivity with no good food no good portable drinking water, and no shelter on their heads. If you are a father and you have a girl, child, in the hands of kidnappers, it's going to be a very serious you know, nightmare. It's like dying every day. This issue of kidnapping in our academic institutions is a deliberate attempt by those criminals and their supporters to make education very, very, very inaccessible in majorly the northern part of this country. National Assembly correspondent Mitare Ikpeng also reports that the House at Tuesday's plenary passed the bill for an act to establish a national center for the coordination and control of the pro proliferation of small arms and light weapons in Nigeria, as well as the bill for an act to repeal the Fire Service Act 2004 and enact the Federal Fire and Rescue Service Establishment Bill. 2023. In other news, by supporting each other, pursuing education and sustaining conversations on issues that affect their growth, women stand better chance of creating a world of more opportunities for themselves given the new consciousness among them about their own potential and role in national development. Nigeria's First Lady Oluremi Tinubu stated this while declaring open the 23rd National Women Conference of the Committee of Wives of Lagos State Officials. The conference, which has served as an annual rallying point for women within and beyond Lagos State to introspect and engage on issues affecting them, has as theme, unleash your potential to do that the first lady charged them to break barriers and interrogate stereotypes while adopting a more positive mindset about who they are in the task of reshaping the society. It is about uplifting our families, communities, and our great nation as a whole. When women are empowered, society thrives. I call upon each and every one of you to embrace the theme of this conference unleash your potential, not only for your benefit, but for your individual states and the benefit of our beloved nation. Speakers at the conference, including the Senate president, represented by his wife, Ikaite Akbabio, and Lagos State Governor, Babajide Samwolu, described the focus of the conference as another clarion call to bring more women on board in governance. They noted that Nigeria needs the contribution of all women supporting the present administration to drive ongoing reforms. 
Elsewhere, key figures involved in the upcoming Kogi state governorship election have shown confidence in the state of readiness of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, for the upcoming polls. Their optimism stems from the smooth execution of a mock accreditation drill in designated registration zones within the state. They are hopeful that these high standards will be maintained with diligence during the upcoming election. Solomon Aedehe reports. The mock accreditation exercise served the crucial purpose of evaluating the effectiveness of the bimodal voter verification and authentication system BIVAS and various devices designed to facilitate the electronic transmission of election results. This meticulous assessment aimed to ensure the flawless operation of these systems in the forthcoming gubernatorial elections in Bielsa, Imo and Kogi states. It is a very important component. They need to uh, really carry out that uh, mock accreditation to optimize their system so we don't disenfranchise anybody from casting their front, uh, yes. foot. In Kogi State, the exercise unfolded across nine distinct registration areas spanning the three central districts of the state. Within the capital city of Lokoja, Crowder Memorial College and Ganaja Primary School polling units emerged as the testing grounds for the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in anticipation of the November 11 governorship election. Nonetheless, onlookers, political party representatives, and the electorate exuded confidence in INEC's level of preparedness. Their optimism and expectations are that these exacting standards will be maintained throughout the actual election. Yes, they are fully prepared. Uh, the little lapses and little delays they may have, uh, they would have learned from that accredited, mock accreditation to optimize their system to accommodate them. Expanding our focus to the broader landscape of the state, the exercise was conducted in other selected registration areas as well. It was, however, marred by a low turnout of eligible voters. In Lokoja, Solomon Ayedehi, NTA News. Still staying with Lokoja, Jonathan Omajali joins us live from there to, you know, bring us up to speed with mock accreditation. Hello, Jonathan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Nolan. Very good evening to you. All right. Good evening to you, to Jonathan. Uh, the primary purpose of the mock accreditation is to assess and verify performance of the beavers, of course. And then, you know, looking at this, how is are people really satisfied with the outcome of what they are seeing um, in terms of the accreditation? Well, uh, of course, like you heard from the report, um, it, there was low turnout. But for those that uh, took part in the accreditation, um, there is this high level of optimism. Uh, and uh, that is coming from the fact that um, the BVAS mission worked um, very well and um, the process went um, hitch free. Um, right now, I'm at the headquarters of INEC in Lokoja, and I have with me the resident electoral commissioner to shed some light on. Um, the mock accreditation. His name is um, Gabriel Longpet, Dr. Gabriel Longpet. Uh, very good evening, sir. Good evening. Yes, um, give us your assessment of um, the mock accreditation on Saturday. Well, I uh, think, uh, as you would just have said, the mock accreditation went on very well. Uh, we didn't have any beaver at all that did not work. All the beavers that were deployed to the various uh, PUs worked very well. Where we had uh, problems with the fingerprints accreditation, the facial recognition perfectly worked. So there was no failure at all with any of the beavers we use. Okay, um, talk to us about um, transmission of result and, um, of course, um, electronic accreditation. Transmission not, is of loading of result, I would rather say, because uh, after the counting at the polling units, and recording the, uh, the various scores for each political party, the APO1 is supposed to snap the, from EC8A the results on that, the scores for each party, and then offload that and send it electronically to the IRF. That is why it should be. And now we have uh, a much enhanced IRF 
where we do not anticipate that we are going to have any difficulties with the with the offloading and transmitting that to the uh, RF from the pulling units. Okay, so invariably you are telling us that we are going to have electronic transmission of results. Is that what you are saying? I'm saying we are going to offload the results from the pulling units and transmit that to the uh, uh, RF, electronically if you want to call it that way, yes. But it is not electronic uh, collation of results. We are going to offload the results from the pulling unit and transmitting them to the IRF, where every citizen who is interested to know can access in real time. Okay. Um, of course, this is going to be the, the, the first major assignment or exercise after what we had earlier this year. Uh, talk to us. How prepared are you? Because, of course, expectations are high. You know, after the general election uh, uh, in February and March, uh, we have seen, the Commission has since reviewed its performances at all levels. We've done that nationally, we've done that at the state level and at the local government levels. We've also involved our stakeholders who are part of the planning and who, who observe the process right up to the election and after the election. So we've made changes. The Commission has made a lot of improvements. We've made a lot of changes to how things are done in terms of uh, being there on time so that people can start uh, voting at 8.30. So materials, as I speak to you now, we've gotten all our non-sensitive materials for, uh, for the state. We've sent them all to the local government. They have been batched into the various areas and up to the uh, polling unit. So we do not anticipate that we are going to have any difficulties. We've engaged the transporters and we are working with the transporters as I speak. We have held several meetings, both at the state and the local government level, so that we can transport men and materials to the right place on the right time on the day. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Well, you heard him. Um, they are expected to raise the bar above what we had earlier this year. And of course, he said they are ready. Time will tell because we have um, less than a month for that to be proven. That is it from here, Nolin. Uh, very well, Jonathan. Good luck. All right, the federal government has reiterated that only the special duties and intergovernmental affairs ministry has demanded to certify payments of zonal intervention projects and constituency projects executed by ministries, departments and agencies. This is contained in a service-wide circular titled Revised Guidelines on the Implementation of Zonal Intervention Projects and Constituency Projects signed by the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Senator George Akume, stated, stating that no payment shall be made to any contractor for zonal and constituency projects by MDS without verification of the execution of such projects or programs and certification by the Minister of Special Duties and Intergovernmental Affairs. It further states that implementing MDS shall invite the Federal Ministry of Special Duties and Intergovernmental Affairs to verify all zonal intervention and the constituency project as non-compliance with the guidelines will be viewed as lack of proper implementation of the programs and projects. MDS that fail to comply with this circular shall be excluded from the implementation of zonal intervention projects and constituency projects in subsequent federal government budgets. Edo State's government is taking advantage of technology and other electronic alternatives to reposition public service for efficiency by equipping the service through training and retraining and operating an e-administrative system. Good luck. Inani has a special report on this new drive. Public service in Edo State is propelled by over 3,000 workforce manning the various ministries and parastatas, with each contributing to the state GDP. To reposition the public service in line with international best practices and for enhanced productivity, the Obaseki-led administration 
to some bold steps towards making the human resources more result-oriented through a conducive working environment coupled with enhanced welfare packages. Our work processes are a lot now effective, a lot more effective now than they ever were. And of course, it has also helped us significantly to deal with the issue of corruption. Our application of technology is known to improve efficiency in any setting. So we do believe this is going to improve uh, the productivity of the workforce of Edo State. Part of the effort to prepare the workforce for the e-governance was the training of Edo workers at the John Odige Oyegun Public Service Academy and equip them with necessary skills, which include the use of technology for the success of the state digitization policy officially put in place on September 1st. 2023 in Benin. Good luck in any NT News. We now join Udua Kobong Achibong, who is standing by the John Odige Oyegun Public Service Academy, Benin, to interface with the Director General of the Center, Imahuan Precious Ojonu, on how the e governance is boosting workplace culture in Edo State. Udua Kobong, before you interview the director what is Edo State's level of digital compliance across the public service in the state is it the first you know in the region to be fully digitized yeah thank you Nolin uh, welcome to Benin yes the whole world is talking of digitization and Edo State has chosen to go digital and one of the platforms is achieving its e-governance initiative is the John Odige Oyegun Public Service Academy. This academy so far has trained over 5,000 civil and public servants to enhance their capacity, skills and knowledge for high productivity. Well, to speak further on the retooling of a Doe State Public Service to make it a robust, result-oriented workplace, is the Director General of this particular academy, Precious Ajunu. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Imoahe Ajunu, and I am so um, proud and thankful to manage a startup public service academy in Edo State. Let me ask you, yes, yes we are talking of a uh, digital revolution in Edo public service. So far, has it been, has government driving this? I think it's very exciting. I mean, when you think about the possibilities that exist with e-governance, right, um, moving from, so to speak, an analog way of doing things um, to a more digital approach, and the possibilities are legion. At JUPSA, our core mandate is to help strengthen that entire process, making sure that our workers have the skills, knowledge and abilities to be able to use um, and then leverage um, the dig digital technologies that exist to us. Yes, yeah, so far, how beneficial has it been to the workforce? Talking of, uh, you train them here and you, re you how beneficial has it been to the workforce? Talking about training and retraining, you know, so you want to boost their capacity and also strengthen institutions. How has it been so far? Tell your story. So I think it's been very exciting. Um, one of the things you don't want to do with change management um, is to come up with a new concept and not first socialize the people into the new ways of doing things. You don't want to do that. Um, so one of the things that we did um, at JUPSA was to make sure that we formed a change coalition made up of all the directors of admin shared services across all MDAs to say, look, um, this is the direction that the government is going. Um, this is where we want to be as a do state government in the next 30 years. And JUPSA is an enabler of that vision, um, do you see? Um, so I think that um, our civil and public servants appreciate the fact that they're being trained. So you're not asking them to do something that they've not been equipped to be able to do. So our job, uh, if you like, is to enable the engine of government run as it should. Yes, the enable engine of government to run. We are talking about recently I heard the state government said no more paper. It's a paperless kind of uh, administration we are having. And already it has kick-started in the state. Tell us more about this. 
I mean, I'm very excited to say that JUPSA is one of the agencies that are 100% paperless. So it's not an audio thing. It's something that we're really doing. Um, you were in my office earlier, and I'm sure you noticed that there was no paper anywhere in sight. Um, we use eGov. We, use, um, we have a platform where we send our memos out. You know, we make use of our Edo State emails. And it's seamless, not just seamless. It's also transparent. And then gone are those days where I send you a file. There's a digital trail now. So I send you a file and you're not able to say I didn't receive the file for whatever reason. Because no, it's in your email or it's in, better yet, it's in your ego. And we're able to, and the system is very intuitive. If within 24 to 48 hours you haven't responded to, to a message on your ego, it will prompt you. You will get an email from your ego auto-generated that you know is reminding you to say, look, so it's some sort of smart messenger to say, please make sure that you're attending to this and you're doing this. So it makes government more responsive and more agile, um, if you like. Right. Uh, yes, talking about, I've been speaking with um, the director general of this particular academy, Precious Ajonu, on the e-governance in the state, bringing in the public service and the uh, workers around. So this is where we have it uh, with uh, this particular Please, yes, and um, I think uh, we have to pause now to join the studios, commercials coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you for staying with us on Nationwide. We shall be joining Adiola Komiakere in our Lagos Network Center for more news on Nationwide. Hello, Adiola. Nolin. The International Day for Eradication of Poverty is observed globally to raise awareness on the need to seek collective action against poverty and for governments all round the, around the world to take concrete steps towards eliminating poverty. It also serves as a reminder that poverty is not only a global challenge but also a barrier to achieving social justice and sustainable development. In Nigeria, the federal government has embarked on several initiatives targeted at job creation for the youth and empowerment of women and vulnerable groups. However, Experts say government should expedite action by stimulating the economy to stem increasing costs of living. Joel Bobola has the details. Protecting the welfare and well-being of the people is a primary responsibility of any government. Eradication of extreme poverty has been a major policy thrust of successive administrations in Nigeria. Early interventions in this regard include the National Poverty Alleviation Program, NAPEP, P and Empower, others are Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program, National Homegrown School Feeding Program, Conditional Cash Transfer, Trader Money, and many more. The current administration of President Bola Tinobu is also tackling the extreme poverty through already established programs. This is in addition to the food palliatives targeted at 15 million households and other social intervention programs of the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. Economic experts, however, posited that beyond the handouts, it is time to think outside the box with adoption of different approach to ensure that these policies impact on the life of the average Nigerian. That we need to look at poverty alleviation above the level of just providing basic food for people, just providing source of livelihood for people. We must back it up with education, human capital development. Where I think there's really an opportunity uh, is to work with the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, the non-profit organizations, because they are pro poverty eradication organizations. Managing the country's population and achieving sufficiency in food production, as per se, should not be an option but a way forward. We need to manage, you know, the processes of having families so that we don't get into uh, having just too many children for the fun of it. With the theme for this year focusing on decent work and social protection, putting dignity in practice for all, it is expected to bridge the growing inequality and give everyone a sense of belonging. In Lagos, Joel Bukbola, NT News. 
For credibility of journalism not to be eroded, there is need to check quackery in order to ensure professionalism. Again, Joa Bokola reports that this was the consensus of broadcast veterans while speaking on unchecked infiltration into the profession. One profession that cannot afford quackery and unethical conduct in whatever form and measure is journalism. This is because the profession is the mouthpiece through which society is informed. The era of citizen journalism, otherwise referred to as all commerce affair, has opened a window of opportunity for everyone to assume the role of a journalist. This informed the consensus of experts in the profession to call for it to be mandatory for practitioners to pass through professional examination as the minimum qualification for a journalist is not well defined. Even the Nigerian Press Council uh, Act has even stipulated the uh, criteria for a passing journalist, the number of years you must spend before you can become a journalist, you can become a registered journalist, and you have to go to Ogan, even if you have a um, um, degree in humanities or different disciplines. There must be basic training, very important. But the, that training either has to be institutional, through schools and all that, or on the job. You can rule out on the job training. Even those who have gone to institutions must still be trained on the job. And for the avoidance of doubt, veteran journalists are of the opinion that there should be a proper definition of who a journalist is. It does not mean because you have a telephone, you can take pictures that makes you a journalist. But you must learn the, 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 the trade, so to say. You don't have the knowledge of uh, uh, journalism, you just find yourself there. There is no way you will not fumble. The consensus of stakeholders is for conversations like this that seeks to deepen credibility of the profession to continue while there should be measures to serve as a deterrent. In Lagos, Joel Bukbola, NT News. And those are the stories from Lagos. We now go over to Enugu, where Chiagono is standing by to give us stories from that zone. Hello, Chiagono, over to you. Good afternoon and welcome to Enugu. As part of measures to transform the Nigerian army into a well-trained, equipped and highly motivated force, the 2023-82 Division Operational Plan in Keda is ongoing in Enugu. Chinenyongoye reports that the Keda will equip the officers and other participants with the requisite skills to plan and execute military operations seamlessly. Gathered in this auditorium for the 2023-82 Division Operational Planning Cadre are officers, resource persons from the Nigerian Army, as well as other participants from the paramilitary agencies. This cadre, which is a yearly event, is very expedient considering the increased participation of the Nigerian Army in exercises, joint and multinational operations. General Officer Commanding 82 Division Nigerian Army Major General Hassan Taiwo Dada, represented, believes that some peculiar events within the division's area of responsibility also makes it imperative for the training and retraining of officers for them to continue to evolve their tactics, techniques and procedures where necessary. But class are therefore encouraged to take the car serious by paying utmost attention in order to understand what is being taught and also make meaningful contributions. We cannot afford to be complacent in our efforts towards ensuring that we are adequately prepared to face any challenge. It is hoped that at the end of the five-day training operational planning cadre, participants will emerge better equipped to fulfill their constitutional responsibilities within a joint environment. In Enugu, Chinenye Nwoye, NTN News. Enugu state government has approved the completion of the International Conference Center, which has been abandoned for over 16 years. Chika Ugu reports that the approval was given at the State Executive Council meeting chaired by Governor Peter Mba. The International Conference Center, which has 3,000 capacity auditorium, 1,500 capacity secondary events venue, DUM, with 500 capacity shopping facility, food courts, recreation center with a mini amusement park, among other facilities. 
when revamped, will be a world-class conferencing venue, become a destination for tourism, create jobs for the teaming youths, and grow the state economy. The Commissioner for Culture and Tourism, Ugochi Madweke, assured that the project will be completed by March 2024. It will bring Enugu an international city, especially with the international airport which we have. It will provide a major attraction to organizers of major conference, conferencing events. The third presidential suffered a lot and is going down, down, decaying and rotting away. And then the state government decided under His Excellency Dr. Peter Lubisimba that it cannot continue that way. Commissioner for Water Resources, Professor Felix Namani, maintained that there is no going back on the 180-day deadline for completion of water projects in the state. In Enugu, Chika Ugu, NTA News. And that is our contribution from Enugu. We will now rejoin Nolene in Abuja for the continuation of Nationwide. Thank you very much, Chigonu. Coming together to eradicate poverty and wide range of issues surrounding poverty is the opportunity the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty is providing across the world. Ibrahim Bellogunda reports that raising awareness about ongoing fight against poverty and the need for concrete steps to alleviate poverty is taking center stage. The United Nations International Day for the Eradication of Poverty is being observed on October 17th to promote awareness on the need to eradicate poverty and destitution worldwide. A recent report by the World Bank in its Macro Poverty Outlook for Nigeria April 2022 projects that about 30 million Nigerians will fall below the international poverty line by 2025 if effort by government to reduce poverty fails. Abigail Edo is a mother of five who is into petty trading and is contributing her quarter to the uh, welfare of her family by taking care of five of her kids, trying to beat the poverty deadline to see that they are empowered economically. If you market, they have to make 50 a day. 50,000? Yes. Pay the capital of the, commodity, the capital of the money, the interest, where you go there. So now we'll go use the chop. I will save small to train my children for school. If you buy and sell, you get game, you buy anything where you want to buy. For family, school fees, everything, if you buy. An economist, Dr. Emeka Okengu says, despite challenges of inflation, food insecurity, reduction in oil export, security challenges among others, Nigeria and Nigerians can get it right in reducing poverty with commitment and attitudinal change by all. Why would a country that has over 80 million square kilometers of arable land be talking about poverty and food insecurity? Because government cannot provide for everybody. Government is, does not, is not limitless. In his, uh, he also has his challenges of funding. So it is all about Nigeria as now knowing that government might never you know, or should never be able to take all of us out of poverty in one fair soap. But we can help government to help us because they say heavens help those who help themselves. With the theme, Dignity for All in Practice, the United Nations International Day for the Eradication of Poverty 2023 aims to raise awareness and draw attention to what it means to live in dignity. In Abuja, Ibrahim Bellogunda, NTA News. The Minister of Women Affairs, Uju Kennedy Ohaninge, is calling on international donor agencies such as the United Nations to be more transparent in utilizing the funds sourced for women and the Nigerian populace. The minister who decried the rising cases of gender-based violence among several issues addressed by international organizations insists that the vulnerable women and children meant to be beneficial of the said funds are not feeling the impact. 3.7 million women and girls are extremely poor. 9% of women aged 15 to 49 have suffered assault and 31% have experienced physical violence. Yet a whole lot of money, monies have been brought into the country through UN 
in the name of our country to help us. I want Nigerians to understand something. UN brings this money in your name to help us. And on behalf of the women and children of this uh, country, I am asking UN for accounts of these monies. We have right to demand for the right things that we favor our masses. That is what we want. The minister is therefore calling for accountability to justify the amount of dollars sourced on behalf of Nigeria. A holistic approach to youth development in Nigeria is to be adopted with a pledge to unveil a roadmap for the ministry. Ministers of Youth Development Jamila Ibrahim and Ayodele Olawande stated this upon assumption in office. Olayin Kaojo reports. Shortly after being sworn in by President Bola Ahmed Tinumbu at the Federal Executive meeting as Minister of Youth Development and that of State for Youth Development, they are ready to pilot the affairs of the Ministry of Youth. The appointment is not just a milestone in the nation's progress, but emphasizes the importance and the role young population play in national development. Now, they are ready to ensure that the renewed hope agenda of the present administration for young people is achieved and challenges youth face in the country addressed. It's, it's, it cuts across and it has to be a holistic you know, um, approach to development. And we must you know, hear from everyone to know where we stand as a ministry and then we work together to design a plan for where we want to go. All I can say for now is that God bless you. The ministers appealed to all to join hands in serving the nation selflessly as it is the only way to make a significant impact and bring about positive change. Online Kaujo, NTA News. We shall be joining Nana Aisha in our Sokoto Network Center for more on Nationwide. Good evening, Nana. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Sokoto. The Committee for the Distribution of Palliatives in Sokoto State has so far received most of the grains procured by the government and distribution has commenced across the state. Chairman of the committee, Ambassador Abubakar Sheikh Wurno, stated this while briefing journalists on the development, saying all measures have been taken to ensure equitable distribution of grains at all levels. Zainab Saidu Abdel Nasser reports. So Abubakar Sheikh Wurno said reports received so far from local government areas on the distribution are encouraging. He said out of the 57 bags of rice, 44,000 bags of maize, and 26,000 bags of millet promised by the state government, only a few thousands are yet to arrive. Ambassador will no further stress that the grains are verifiably standard in terms of quality and quantity, and security is tied from the state stores up to the various destinations. We are using the you know register of ENEC, which is for general public. Whoever is registered within that unit, and once you come, you will get the, 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 the pilot tips. He commended the integrity of the committee members and security agencies, saying distribution of fertilizer free to farmers will soon follow after the distribution of the grains. Ambassador Wurno also reiterated that the distribution of the grains is free for all eligible persons at all polling units in the state, irrespective of political party affiliation. In support of Zainab Said Abdel Nasser, NTA News. Water sewage system has been advocated for to address the food problem in Nigeria. This was at an event to mark World Food Day in Sokoto. Balhatu Abdullahi has more. 16th of October has been set aside by the United Nations in 1945 to commemorate World Food Day annually, which started in 1979. The idea is to create awareness on the need for global action and solidarity against hunger, poverty, malnutrition and for security. With the theme 2023, water is life, water is food, leave no one behind. The district head of Kilgori, Dr. Muhammad Jabi Kilgori, spoke on the historical and rationale of World Food Day. 
Dr. Kilgori highlighted the role of water for life on Earth and as foundation for food. He described water as ingredient in life, agriculture, and food security, stressing the need to conserve and use it efficiently. He emphasized the need for active participation in agricultural value chain by all stakeholders to support food security drive. Dr. Kilgori further stated that global food security is achieved only when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food for active and healthy life. He advocated for water sewage system in Nigeria in line with world practice to address food problems in Nigeria. We have to recycle water because water is becoming increasingly unavailable. There is threat from climate change and there is continuous demand because of growing population, growing industries. Paper reviewer Dr. Abubakar Sokto Mohammed viewed the presentation on the basis for need to have sufficiency in food as solution to hunger, poverty and crisis among others across the globe. There was presentation of cooked food to internally displaced persons. The event was organized by U.S. Exchange alumni in Sakwato. In Sakwato, Dalhatu Abdullahi, NTA News. Well, that's our contribution here in Sokoto. Nationwide continues with Norlene in Abuja. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for staying with us on Nationwide, and this is Abuja. We shall be joining Abubakar in our Medugri Network Center for more stories from the home of peace. Hi, Abubakar. Always good to see you, Nolin, and thank you for joining us. Governor Babugana Umara Zulum of Borno State has revoked a land belonging to the Nigeria Railway Corporation housing illegal shanties. The governor, who was responding to public outcry over security breaches emanating from the shanties, gave a 72-hour ultimatum for residents of the slum to vacate and give way for demolition. Kaigama Mustafa has more on the story. Slams around Galajima to railway by and quarters and classified Sunday. by the police as security risks have been notorious for all forms of criminal activities, including prostitution that involves minors, sales and consumption of alcohol, gangsterism, killings, and other social vices, in spite of sustained efforts by the present administration to end the menace. Lucy Yunana, a woman activist on gender-based violence, led other women to the scene behind the railway terminals where she briefed the governor on the crimes being perpetrated, especially rape and assault on minors, among others. And we have come here as mothers and we discover a lot of young girls into prostitution, minors. They are into prostitution here in the night. A community leader also confirmed to Governor Zulu the atrocities being committed there and called on government to intervene. Governor Babagana Umara Zulum, who was shocked by the revelations, described the slums as pleading place for insurgents and gave 72 hours ultimatum to occupants to vacate to pave the way for the demolition work to commence. Government has completely usurped the powers of the, the land and then henceforth this land belongs to Borno State Government. The governor equally gave 12 hours ultimatum to hotels operating illegally around the same place to also vacate for the demolition work to commence. Borno State has made wide range of policies to rid the state of post insurgency criminalities, including the demolition of some unregistered hotels and places notorious for harboring criminals. In Medugri, Kaigama Mustafa, NTA News. Away from that now, the Nigeria Army Resource Center has engaged senior non commissioned officers on leadership awareness and development costs to equip them with advanced knowledge and skills for efficient delivery of their mandate. Paul Nkujivana reports that the event took place at the Theater Command Officers Mess, Memalari Cantonment, Meduguri. The training is designed to provide officers with skills and knowledge for effective service delivery. The Director General Nigerian Army Resource Center, Major General Garba Wahab, retired, represented by Executive Director Consult, Major General Abuba Kandalolo, said, when properly equipped, the officers can be more reliable and goal-oriented in their professional conduct. We transform the Nigerian Army into 
a well-trained, repeat, highly motivated force towards achieving our constitutional responsibilities in a joint environment. The General Officer Commanding 7th Division Nigerian Army, Major General Peter Mala, explained that the Army is committed to providing its officers with the best possible training and support to ensure they have the skills and knowledge needed to succeed. The Leadership Awareness and Development course is aimed at enhancing creativity, emotional intelligence, critical thinking, and many other contemporary leadership skills amongst the personnel of the Nigerian Army. The Nigerian Army has affirmed that it will continue to invest in the training of its officers to ensure they are prepared for any challenge they may face. In Meduguri, Paul Nkujevana, NTA News. And those are the latest stories from here. Nolin in Abuja has more reports for us this evening. So, Nolin. Varual Abubakar. Omen Kamarachiku brings us a report from the Nigerian Christian Pilgrims Commission working hard to improve the welfare of Christian pilgrims. Governor Agbo Kefas of Taraba State in the Armed Forces Complex to see greater partnership on the prevailing security threats in the state. And the first step I took was to suspend all mining activities. This is against the background of the nation's common territorial boundary with Cameroon through communities in Taraba State. Cameroonian Amazonians have been threatening uh, our people in that as is. So we want you to look into that area and see how we can increase presence of the troops there so that we'll be able to uh, contain their excesses. We want to continue to maintain very good relationship with uh, Cameroon because our people have business activities with them. The chief of defense staff says the military is enhancing surveillance and operations around flashpoints to unmask and deal with criminal elements. The Ambazonians um, measures are put in place to ensure that we also address their own issues uh, so that they don't come and add into more of the problem we have within the area. Whatever challenges we're having are man-made and so when man is ready to solve them they will be solved. I've realized that the military solution in everywhere is just some percentage of it. Good governance solves a lot of problems. The visit also aims at promoting civil military relations. That was actually a security report on CDS on Cameroonian Ambazonian rebels. And next is sports news. Super Eagles head coach Joseph Pacero says the victory against the Mambas of Mozambique is a moral booster ahead of the team's 2026 World Cup qualifiers, which begins in November. The Nigerian national football side Monday evening defeated the Mambas of Mozambique by three goals to two in an international friendly match. You must put more concentration um, for finishing. You, you cannot allow this team with 10. Our team is better than this team. In the second half, you manage the ball, you do well. So we have a task ahead of us. Let us see. Believe in it, I think we have a very strong team. Still on football, onto the local scene. Ahead of the 2023-24 Nigerian National League, a five-day coaching course is ongoing at the Remo Star Stadium, put together by the board of the NNL in collaboration with Nigerian Institute for Sports. The program tagged upgrading NNL coaches in modern football coaching techniques. The idea is to make the second tier league more attractive and competitive by ensuring that the coaches are up to date on the scientific and modern approach to the game. If you don't get uh, very knowledgeable coaches, there's no way you will get uh, a tactical team, there's no way you, you, your players will play with brain. And the only way the coaches can impact on the players is for them to be top notch. Apart from this, we are also going to now to also do the capacity building for all coaches in Lagos State. Still talking football, the 2023 Lagos Street Soccer has kicked off in Surulere, Lagos, with ceremonial matches in the under-15 men and women categories. The tournament, which focuses on positively engaging the youth in the community and giving them a platform to showcase their talent, returned to Lagos after nine years with season eight. Outside, you know, getting our youths to be engaged and getting them up the streets, it also giving them the opportunity and platform for them to be discovered so that they can take it to the next level. They have intention to, to build this truck, street soccer 
thing into a futsal, full-fledged futsal league, which is going to be indoor. Over 3,000 teams with about 30,000 players are taking part in the competition, which will end in December 2023. With sports updates, Gift George, NTA News. And that concludes Nationwide today. Thank you for watching. I am Nolene Ebel Ame. Do have a fantastic evening. Thank <laughs> you.